Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I have to stay around this position so the camera can capture my image. Um, so I have been given like 30 minutes to do the presentation. Uh, and because the time is short, I'm not going to try to cover what we did like, in previous research as a, as a whole body of, a, of our work, but I'm going to try to focus on one of the aspects of the research that ties with recent projects that we are developing here at UW Medicine, things that we plan on developing further. Okay? Uh, so thanks to the, the Innovation Hub for the invite to be here and all the colleagues from the department for such a welcoming um, uh, reception. Uh, when I joined the department, it has been great. And I hope you guys um, feel free to ask questions at the end as well. So it has been estimated that by year 2050, we will probably um, we will have or we could have 10 million people dying from disease caused by uh, bacteria that uh, carry genes for resistance to anti antibiotics. This is a quite pessimistic estimate, but even before the pandemic of COVID-19 started in 2020, we already had more than 700,000 people dying in the world from disease caused by multidrug resistant bacteria. So if you think about uh, only the United States, combining infectious uh, diseases uh, in hospital settings and procedural difficile uh, associated diseases as well, we have more than 3 million people infected every year and about 50,000 Americans dying from um, disease can um, uh, usually uh, are not easily treated with antibiotics. Um, this problem has been uh, also related within the umbrella of the One Health concept with problems of feeding antibiotics to animal and livestock in general. Um, uh, this is a, a major issue because 70% of the antibiotics that are actually produced are actually given to animals, not to humans. Only 30% goes to humans. And this creates uh, a problem of uh, antibiotic resistance in the food chain. We have like spread of um, genes through manure and bacteria resistance uh, with resistance in foods. And, and that could do, reach also the like, humans. Uh, and this uh, problem can be also aggravated by the perspective that the world population is increasing in the following decades, and we have a problem with uh, actually a dilemma of uh, more people in the world. We need to feed these people. We need to um, in, uh, uh, do like more intensive farming. And when you put more animals together in the same environment, the chances for uh, infectious disease also increase. And you have to uh, you need measures to prevent the spread of the prevalence and the spread of disease in these environments as well. And this also ties with other concerns in livestock production related to animal, see if this works, animal well-being, uh, the animal productivity, animal health, zoonotic um, diseases and the spread to humans, and also questions related to food safety and impact on the environment. So what all of this has to do with, uh, with this talk? Well, uh, we believe that um, some opportunities for uh, alternatives to, to solve some, at least some of these problems uh, can be found in the stomach of cows. And um, the rumen of um, cows, they have a very diverse and very dense microbial community, and these microbes interact with each other in different ways. Some of these interactions um, are kind of neutral or positive for the members of the association, but rumen microbes, they also must compete for the available resources. And uh, one way that they do that, they do that in different ways uh, regarding the affinity for substrate, but also by um, uh, interacting indirectly through a chemical warfare with other organisms in the same ecosystem. So throughout the evolution of the rumen ecosystem, several metabolic capabilities were developed in this microorganism that we can actually harvest for applied applications. And some of them are listed uh, in this slide here. Well, a lot of people are mining uh, rumen microbes for application as enzyme producers, hydrolytic enzymes for application biofuel production, for example. Also, um, um, anaerobic bioconversions, several other applications as well. The thing that I'm going to focus um, on this talk will be primarily on antimicrobial compounds. And why I'm going to focus on that? Because of their applications in animal and in human health, uh, food preservation, and also as potential modifiers of rumen function. And we can explore some of those, those components as well. If you look at the um, literature, you'll see that there is a lot of uh, growing interest in a particular group of, of antimicrobials or bioactive molecules produced by 
different ecosystems, soil, marine environments, but also the gut microbiome of humans and livestock animals. And uh, the research on end microbial peptides particularly has increased in the last 15 years with a number of publications and also patents related to um, the discovery applications with antimicrobial peptides. And this is a particular group that uh, um, uh, my research group has been interested in as well. So why is the broad interest in antimicrobial peptides? Well, these molecules have been around for quite a while. They are um, natural effectors of our immune system. We use our cells use uh, antimicrobial peptides to protect against pathogens. Uh, these molecules, they show enormous diversity of sequences and, and secondary structures. They have um, excellent stability to extremes of pH and temperature. Some of them you can autoclave. They still uh, maintain their activity. They work at very low pH, very high pH sometimes, depending on the molecules they're exploring. And they also have mo multiple modes of action, and, uh, but at the same time, low toxicity against eukaryotic cells, which allows them to some flexibility in terms of use. And because of those multiple modes of actions, they can have like show fast killing and low rate of uh, acquire, acquire resistance in target organisms as well. So it has been shown that antimicrobial peptides usually do not elicit um, stress pathways and mutagenesis in target organisms, which is a, a desired uh, characteristic. And because they are gene encoded, we can bioengineer the sequence of amino acids that uh, these genes encode to actually improve their activity, their spectrum of activity, and also their stability. And importantly, uh, I want to point out the fact that they can also be combined with antibiotics and other molecules to improve their efficacy and or the efficacy of other molecules. So there are several approaches to discover these compounds. Um, I'm listing here the, the four main ones that have been used so far. Um, the ecological approach, which is basically a phenotype mining approach or the classical approach where we isolate organisms for a particular environment, in this case, for example, the rumen, and we um, select the ones that show antimicrobial activity in deferred assays uh, in vitro, for, for example. Um, and then we, you can proceed with the purification of the molecules and characterization of these molecules as well. But we can also use um, culture independence approaches based, for example, on genome mining or metagenome mining, where uh, you can identify biosynthetic gene clusters responsible for the production of these molecules. So some of the enzymes used, for example, in post-translational uh, modification, they have um, some conserved motifs that you can use for, for as a strategy to find these um, uh, novel uh, biosynthetic gene clusters. Um, this can also be applied for functional metagenome mining, in this case, um, basically what you do is you get like the whole um, um, array of uh, genes in a microbial community. You do cloning of these genes in a metagenomic library, and you select the clones that have the specific activity that you are interested in. And more recently, there are a lot of work applying machine learning techniques for uh, identifying these um, molecules as well. And how you can do that? You can feed like your model with biochemical properties, uh, motifs that are conserved and certain regions and biochemical properties of these molecules, uh, and uh, you put this in a model that will search for molecules with similar activity or potential uh, activity in, uh, for example, in a metagenome or other sequence that you feed your model with, and you try to predict that activity in the, the molecules that arrived uh, from, from your search. So we have used a lot of these uh, different approaches to identify these molecules. Uh, some of the peptides that you see listed there uh, came up from, from uh, some of these studies that we did previously. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to mention a few things related to um, um, some results associated with the distribution of these molecules in the room in microbiota. And we did like a previous work where we uh, initially uh, were interested in investigating the, how these uh, biosynthetic gene clusters encoding antimicrobial peptides are distributed in, across different genomes of rumen bacteria. We found that this is a feature that a lot of rumen microbes contain in their genomes. And um, you, you see like different genera of bacteria with different groups of uh, molecules that could be produced by them, by, by these organisms. And if you look at their genomes, you can find um, complete biosynthetic gene clusters potentially encoding these molecules. And some of them are grouped more phylogenetically with certain um, species of rumen bacteria, certain genes of rumen bacteria. Um, 
So we moved to do, uh, um, more recently, um, a phenotype basing, uh, based uh, approach of isolating uh, one of these particular groups that were reveal, revealed in these previous studies, particularly we're interested in streptococci, because this is one of the groups that we found in the rumen ecosystem that contain a lot of those complete biosynthetic genic clusters. And we did an um, isolation of almost 500 strains of uh, rumen bacteria that could grow in simple media. Uh, we select them, test their activity against different bacterial um, targets, and we did whole genome sequencing of these organisms, and did like, some genomic comparison between these strains, and also um, um, some genome mining to identify the bi biosynthetic genic clusters that were present in, in these genomes. Um, we found some interesting features in these organisms because only a few of the isolates could actually produce antimicrobial substances in liquid media. Most of them produce only in solid media. And this is an interesting feature when you think about uh, the production and, and the expression of these molecules in the rumen ecosystem because it probably is linked to the way that these organisms compete with each other and how they colonize, for example, certain niches in the rumen ecosystem. Um, so, so we did comparisons of the genomes of these organisms, and, and another interesting find was that some of the strains that we obtained from these environments, they contain exactly the same biosynthetic gene clusters um, associated with the production of these molecules, which is kind of interesting because it seems to be uh, distributed, a, a characteristic distributed across different um, um, strains of within the same genes, for example. And we also found sequences that pretty much when they were aligned, they encode for the same molecules uh, in this ecosystem. Uh, in this case, we found one that was similar to ubericin, which is a, a peptide that has been reported previously that's uh, encoded by streptococcus uberis, isolated from raw uh, milk from, from cattle. And we did a characterization of the molecules produced by this group of uh, streptococci. They review like a, a peptide of 5.6 kilodaltons that uh, showed um, characteristics um, uh, that we are expecting for an antimicrobial peptide as well. So we move further uh, to do um, analysis of the distribution of these um, peptides using a, a different approach. In this case, was PCR screening of a target gene for the, the group called bovisens in the, the room, in the, the septococci from the rumen. In this case, we used isolates, like 150 isolates, um, 75 from beef cattle, 75 from dairy cattle, uh, they, of course, had different diets, and we found that uh, the majority uh, of the beef cattle isolates, they contain genes encoding these um, peptides, this, this group of peptides called the bovicins, uh, but none was found in the dairy cattle isolates, which is kind of interesting. We are we're still intrigued by the, the differences uh, in these isolates and why is, is this happening. Diet might be a factor. This is affecting this competition effect, and there are other um, explanations that I'm not going to go through right now, but we, we uh, believe that's a very interesting aspect to look at these isolates and, and the role, the ecological role that these molecules will have in this ecosystem. This actually, when you do the 16S analysis of these isolates, they actually separate in different clades from beef cattle and dairy cattle. And when you look at the ones that actually produce these molecules and you find the gene, actually they are pretty much, in, at least in the isolates that we tested, they share like exactly the same sequence of the, of the molecule that, that they produce. And this was a find that matches with a previous report of studies that were done in New Zealand and also here in North America, uh, showing that um, Aceptococci, Aceptococcus bovis specifically, found in these different countries, they also produce the same molecule. And, and indicating that this is geographically dispersed and probably important for, uh, for um, the competitive or, or the lifestyle of this um, um, streptococci in the rumen ecosystem. There are other things related to the genomic difference between rumen streptococcus compared to the dairy streptococcus. They're, they're quite interesting, um, uh, and we need to, to still explore more of this. We also look at the uh, production of secondary metabolites by rumen um, bacteria. And in this case, we used an array of the genomes of the Hungate 1000 collection that was a, um, a large uh, genome sequencing project that was developed in New Zealand in 2012. And we um, screened more than 320 uh, genomes for the distribution of these biosynthetic um, 
not paracinetic gene class, but the, the enzymes that are involved in the production of a non-ribosomal peptide, which is the um, non-ribosomal peptide syn synthetase and polyketide synthase. And because these are modular enzymes, they have different motifs, different regions that you can look at uh, in the genomes, and as you can see in this picture here, this, the internal part is the distribution of different rumen bacteria, and uh, the outer rings represent the distribution of these modules of these different enzymes uh, in different groups of bacteria. And you see they are really dispersed and distributed across a lot of these um, organisms in the, in the rumen ecosystem as well. One interesting thing about this, uh, because we wanted to, to investigate if these molecules would have an ecological role uh, in the niche colonization of some of these bacteria, we did the analysis uh, where we were uh, aligning this uh, reads of, the, of a transcriptome, metatranscriptome uh, study that was done with a partner in the UK, uh, where they were looking at the colonization of uh, perennial high grass over time and trying to understand how the colonization process happened over time. And they identified uh, different stages of colonization, we have like an initial four hour period where you have the primary colonization of, of after four hours, the secondary colonization, which indicates like microbial succession in the process. When we did the mapping of these secondary metabolites with this metatranscriptome analysis, we identified that uh, they are actually expressed and especially in the second, um, second stage of the fiber colonization which indicates that this might play a role in how some of these species of bacteria succeed uh, colonizing fiber compared to the ones that probably don't have that capability. And this was concentrated in two groups, specifically the Butyri vibrios and Ruminococci, which are also known to, to be involved in, in fiber digestion also. It was an uh, interesting um, finding. Um, we have several other collaborative work on microbiome-derived AMPs. I'm not going to cover everything because there are some studies that are more related to the mechanism of action of these molecules. Some of them are more targeted towards uh, specific uh, pathogens that we, we uh, wanted to investigate. Some of them are much drug-resistant ones, like Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and, but there are a lot of other things that we can apply uh, regarding the characterization of these molecules, not only purification, but characterization and application of these molecules as well, um, just to, to give an, uh, an example of uh, other things that can be done there. So, so the question is, why is this important to the Wisconsin dairy industry? So Wisconsin is a major player in milk and cheese production, not only in the United States, but like overall. And um, dairy farmers know that bovine mastitis is an important disease in dairy cattle. It's a costly disease to the animals, costs uh, about around like $2 billion dollars per year to the U.S. dairy industry. And um, in recent years, we have been seeing um, two things, uh, not, not in recent years, but uh, uh, this is one of the main reasons why antibiotics are used in dairy cattle the, 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 to treat mastitis. And also, we, in the recent years, we have been seeing like a change in the etiology of the, um, uh, the pathogens causing the disease. Um, Traditionally, Staphylococcus aureus was, uh, in several countries, is still uh, like the, the main pathogen associated with uh, uh, bovine mastitis, clinical. For example, in Brazil is one of the main pathogens that are occurring in dairy cattle there. But in other countries, like the U.S., the number of uh, infections caused by Staphylococcus aureus is decreasing, the environmental pathogens are actually increasing. So there's a, a shift in the, the pathogens causing, which creates some challenges for treating the disease. And of course, we need alternatives um, to, to uh, their if, uh, um, show efficacy against these different pathogens. And of course, there are external pressures, okay? Early this year, for example, the European Union banned the use of, routine use of antibiotics in farm animals as a prophylactic measure, which creates like external pressures, of course, and it starts in, in one region of the, the globe and expresses to other regions, that we need like, to find alternatives to, to control these pathogens as well. So we currently have a, um, a data innovation hub funded project that is focused on combinatorial AMP therapy to control bovine mastitis. This is one project that uh, Ana Julia is one of the students the lab is working on. And the objective here is to develop antibiotic free or to use formulations that reduce the use of antibiotics to treat these pathogens causing uh, mastitis. Um, so the dry 
uh, dry period is an important period for the mastitis occurrence because that's when most of the infections are acquired by the animal, and the period be just before calving or just after calving, that's when most of the infections happen. That's why we have the blanket dry cow therapy and other uh, or selective uh, dry cow therapy to, to try to control these infections. And um, so we have uh, uh, collaboration with the uh, Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, so they provide us a, a panel of several cultures from different species and different genera of bacteria associated with the clinical mastitis, and we are um, trying to design some formulations that could target these different pathogens, especially the, um, the uh, environmental pathogens associated with, uh, with bovine mastitis. And this is based on previous research that indicate that some of the peptides derived from the rumen uh, uh, ecosystem, they can uh, target this organism, including multi-resistant uh, bacteria. There are uh, not really found like in milk in this case, but uh, are tough to, to, to kill, such as the methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, and also some gram-negative bacteria. And they usually these peptides have a very uh, strong activity against some of these bacteria in destroying uh, the integrity of the cell envelope of these organisms as well. So the approach that we are using is to, um, of course, the, uh, evaluate the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentrations of these different molecules that we wanted to combine and use checkerboarder methods and also isobologram analysis, like the ones uh, shown here, to identify uh, combinations that will be either additive or synergistic in terms of their action against these pathogens. If you see a figure like that with a curve underneath the dotted line, that indicates a synergistic effect of these drug combinations, and then we can select some of these to, to formulate um, uh, preparations that actually can kill better, like the cells, like that. So you see the, the, the impact that they have on the growth of the, the bacteria when we play that. Um, so this is the stage that we are going to design right now. The next stage will be uh, to evaluate the toxicity of these proposed drug combinations, because one thing you have, uh, the, the, uh, even though they have very low toxicity, when you combine different molecules, they, they can affect how they will interact with the eukaryotic cells. We wanted to evaluate that. And also evaluate if these uh, combinations can also um, prevent the critical steps of the infection to occur, especially adhesion and invasion of the bovine mammary gland. Um, and uh, we, this is going to be done in vitro, and this um, then we, we plan to move forward to in vivo trials and evaluate the efficacy of these formulations um, in animals and compare that with uh, traditional antibiotics, of course. Uh, this follows up with a, a proposal that we submitted at like, the beginning of August to the USDA NIFA AFRI program on uh, disease of agriculture animals. Um, in this case, uh, proposing a, a combination of antimicrobial peptides and proanthocyanidins obtained from cranberries. Uh, also as an alternative of antibiotic-free formulations for treating mastitis. This work builds up on previous observations ba based on the, the uh, made by uh, the co uh, Professor Jess Reed and, and Chris Kruger, um, where they observed that proanthocyanidins can do an agglutination process of some um, um, bacterial pathogens such as E. coli, and that our hypothesis here is that this this uh, activity of the proanthocyanidins will uh, improve the efficacy of killing of the antimicrobial peptides when they are combined together. So in one way of, we're thinking about delivering this is through the, the um, formulation of hydrogels or, and uh, formulations that could be used as a teeth sellant to, to the animals as well. And of course, with these kind of preparations, you can also think about other topical applications for livestock and even um, to humans. Um, Another project that has been funded by the Data Innovation Hub relates to the, to the graduate student assistantship that, um, um, that supporting uh, Alice Perez and her work on the, on the PhD degree. In this case, we're focusing on controlling ruminant emissions, methane emissions, uh, using lactic acid uh, metabolites, uh, lactic acid bacteria and their metabolites. So um, there are several work related to the study of lactic acid bacteria and how they, they can uh, interfere with um, uh, fermentative process, not so much in the rumen ecosystem. We have previous data indicating that some of the metabolites produced by these organisms can reduce methane and also deamination. This is something that we noticed that's really strong, reduce deamination of amino acids in the rumen ecosystem. And the objective of this project will be to uh, have a large culture collection of these organisms, particularly isolated from the rumen, which is lacking uh, right now. Uh, and evaluate direct inhibition of methanogenic, uh, methanogens and also bacteria 
by this um, lactic acid bacteria. We're going to move with a whole genome sequencing, characterization of the bioactive molecules, and we hope to evaluate and uh, find effective strains that can perform this activity following this work. Um, another uh, proposal that was also submitted to the USDA at the beginning of uh, August was to the program on animal nutrition growth and lactation. Involves the tripartite um, proposal uh, where we plan to evaluate locally sourced, uh, locally sourced alternatives, uh, feedstuffs for improving rumen function and also reducing methane emissions. Uh, this was elaborated, uh, involved several institutions. Um, uh, the co PIs are uh, Professor Gerd Suen from the Bacterial Department, Steve Wicke from our department, Matthias Hess from UC Davis, and also Sharon Hughes from Queen's University Belfast, and David Kenny from uh, Tiagas in Ireland. So this um, is a project that we are um, elaborating on performing in vitro studies that we, uh, we do gas production in vitro, also uh, room and simulation techniques as a RUSITEC system to evaluate these different um, 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 alternative feedstuff available in different locations that we have mapped, some of them that uh, could have potential activity again as an anti-methanogenic um, feedstuff, and also uh, move to in animal trials to validate their, our results in vitro and performing multiomic analysis in this case to evaluate their effects on, on rumen function, especially 16S ribosome RNA uh, sequencing, metagenomics, uh, metaproteomics, and metabolomics on, on, the, uh, on the samples collected from these trials. And also, there is an um, economical component here uh, that we are planning. Oops, sorry. Me, uh, uh, economic component here that we plan to do life cycle analysis um, to evaluate like the, the use of this um, feedstuffs and the viability uh, or sustainability of the use uh, um, in such system. Um, another proposal that has uh, been submitted like, a couple weeks ago uh, is to the USDA multidisciplinary hatch, involves the effect of uh, dietary um, additives on feed efficiency and methane emissions in dairy cattle. This was with uh, Copy is uh, Heather White, Pierre Tsui, and Steve Rick, and uh, Elizabeth French as uh, our collaborator in that project also. And the overall objective is to analyze, in this case, energy and nitrogen precursors uh, and uh, to evaluate if they can promote shifts in, in the rumen fermentation um, end products uh, that could be um, used for improving nutrient utilization efficiency, not only in vitro, but also in vivo. Um, other perspectives for collaboration. Uh, for collaborative research at UW Medicine and beyond, involves project with um, Sarah uh, at uh, at Cock, a professor, uh, assistant professor in our department. Uh, we are working together in this uh, proposal for um, diagnos diagnosis and treatment of mastitis in dairy cattle. Uh, the parts that I, I will be collaborating with her uh, will be on the characterization of antibiotic resistance uh, in pathogens associated with mastitis in sheep, and also trying out to develop alternative and alternative therapies to reduce um, antibiotic use in sheep. This builds on, on work that we have done in other uh, systems looking at antimicrobial resistance. This is also an area of research that we are quite interested. Uh, we have done previous work with uh, pigs in the gut microbiome of pigs looking at the antibiotic resistance um, in these animals, um, especially comparing animals where that were fed antibiotic growth promoters in their diet with control animals that were not exposed. And um, looking at the differences are quite interesting that uh, you can uh, find a lot of resistance genes even in the control group that do not, uh, they're not fed antibiotics. They're, they're there, they're in the environment. So yeah, but you can do the analysis uh, on the different isolates and, and determine uh, these different profiles. And we also are, are co collaborating with uh, Davi uh, Jamarillo from the U.S. Uh, Dairy Forge uh, Center and then Ken Kosher uh, on a project that was submitted to the, to the USDA NIFA AFRI program as well um, that involves following up the, the developmental difference between high heifers that uh, will be maintained on pasture versus confinement um, and throughout like, the, the lactation period. And uh, we will be collaborating on the analysis of the rumen microbiome composition throughout the growth of the animals but one thing that, uh, that I'm very interested in, in picking back on this project is the longitudinal analysis of, or sampling for characterization of the rumen resistance. Um, this is just follow up like a previous work that we did to characterize the distribution of inter, um, 
antibiotic resistance genes in rumen bacteria. We know that they are there, and the tetracycline resistance is one of the major um, um, components of the antimicrobial resistance that we see in the rumen. But we have very little information about how the antimicrobial resistance genes and resistome evolves in the animal, like from early life to adult life. And also the difference when you have, like, animals on pasture versus animal, for example, fed more concentrated diets, how that impacts the, the rumen resistome. So that's also quite interesting. Um, uh, another topic of interest that I'm quite excited about, and I've been discussing this with Vanessa the previous, <laughs> Vanessa, in the previous uh, weeks, is the uh, culturability problems of the rumen microbiome and complex ecosystem. So this has been pointed out by previous publications uh, made by the Hungate 1000 Consortium, indicating that we do have some representatives of the rumen microbiome deposited in culture collections. You see with these yellow spots here. But all the red arrows indicate uh, cultures or species or genera that we do not have any representatives. And previous attempts to, to culture bacteria from the rumen microbiome indicate that we can pretty much represent 20% of the total OTUs that you see in a sample. So there are a lot of uh, challenges there. <clears throat> what we can learn from doing these kind of studies? First of all, we can determine activities or rates of how these organisms convert or use substrates. We can learn about substrate affinity, substrate preferences, nutritional requirements, metabolic outputs of these different organisms, cross-feeding between species, regulation of metabolism, the effect of the environment on these organisms, and also, we can validate phenotypic predictions, and, of course, the ultimate goal will be to translate this information into applications, designing better probiotics, designing um, um, uh, direct-fed microbials, or even identifying new bioactive molecules that we can work with. So this is just to give you like an overall like idea of stuff that we have interest on. And other things that I'm particularly interested in and hope to, to pursue also at UW Medicine are other topics of interest related to um, the development of synthetic communities of rumen microbes um, based on the utilization of a specific substrates so we can tie this with better approaches for uh, rumen colonization, particularly uh, like young, uh, like animals, young ruminants, and having like a greater success of uh, colonization of the ecosystem with the desired outputs in terms of the, of the microbial communities. Uh, there is a lot of room to work on AMP prediction from rumen metagenomic collections. Um, a lot of data has come, um, has been published in the past uh, five years on, on that field. And this paper just came out early this year uh, on a similar approach that was done with the human gut microbiome where they identified uh, several interesting uh, antimicrobial peptides using also machine learning approach uh, to predict some of these peptides that show active against different uh, array of pathogens. Um, there are potential um, applications, I was just um, talking to Scott about that, uh, on food safety and food preservation. Many of these molecules, uh, we already have experience uh, evaluating their activity against some foodborne pathogens. They are very good against Clostridia against spore-forming bacteria, bacteria that contaminate certain kinds of uh, 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 foods, and they, they could have several different applications. Uh, some of these organisms could be used as silage inoculants, both for improving quality and aerobic stability. Uh, some of them have probiotic properties that could be explored and expand, of course. And um, one last thing that I recently started to, to think about and we have been working on this, a little bit is adaptive uh, laboratory evolution, trying to improve fitness of some anaerobic cultures. And we start doing that um, by uh, imposing some stress um, on rumen microbes, and I'm particularly interested with the response that we have seen, particularly with temperature. And I need to discuss with Jimena and other people that are working with heat stress about that, because that could be something that we can explore further as well. So I'll end this, um, just thank, thanks through the, my previous lab members um, on the Biotin Lab um, in Brazil, and also our current research team that I hope it will grow fast <laughs> here as well. You see a trend also <laughs> in the group here, <laughs> pretty much. Okay, and also um, I would like to thank um, our collaborators, both at UW, um, a lot of people to thank, Garrett, Steve, Heather, Jess, Chris, um, Tom, that has been very helpful in, um, 
helping me like navigate through the UW system as well. Vanessa, uh, Professor Penn at the Enzyme Institute, and also Nicole at the WVDL ha uh, has uh, provided us with the coaches, helping us with the study with the mastitis pathogen, and also Shelly, that's always like awesome with us. Uh, our collaboration, the Dairy Forge Research uh, Center, Ken, Davi, and Lizzie, thanks for all the help that they have provided us, and several of our, oops, sorry, our international collaborators that um, um, some of these studies, uh, they have been involved also, and I have to thank them for that. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you, and take questions. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I'm not sure that it's, it's working. Um, I'm going to speak loud in case this is not working. I'm pushing buttons. It's not? That, that's, it's work. Okay. Um, I'm wondering about the uh, peptides that you are studying, if you know if there are recept mammalian receptors that those peptides can signal and if there is any effect on uh, metabolism in mammalians, in humans, or in, or in farm animals that uh, have been studied? Yeah, we haven't done specifically, like, um, so the question is about uh, the effect of, uh, if, they, if these peptides will have, like, receptors in mammalian cells, if they affect the metabolism in mammalian cells, right? We haven't done specific experiments looking at the uh, response of the mammalian cells uh, to the peptides. We know that they have, we have done, like, uh, not to, to look at the response, but we have done work to investigate their toxicity against mammalian cells. And the, the ones that we test are really low toxicity. Um, they uh, they, they uh, don't cause much damage. And one of the explanations for that is because these molecules are typically positively charged. And the interaction that you have like, with uh, um, the cell envelope of a bacteria is different uh, with compared to the interaction that they have with the um, cell membrane of a mammalian cell, a eukaryotic cell, because of the presence of cholesterol and uh, um, the net charge is different. If you compare like mammalian cell with a bacterial cell, uh, usually the interaction is weaker. That's why uh, this is supposedly one of the explanations why they show low toxicity against eukaryotic cells as well, because of the difference in there. But um, I would imagine, um, Sebastian, that they, they might trigger response because anything that interacts with the cell envelope tends to trigger some response in the, the cell. So we know that like, even the, the peptides that are produced by um, our cells, I mean, they, they have effects not only on microbes, but they respond also to other molecules. So yeah, so they could have, but I don't think there'll be like a response that will cause like a, a, a problem like inflammation or something like that. Uh, we don't expect that to happen at least. Okay, Tom? You'll hold it. Maybe I've been on the 11th floor around Jess Reed for too many years. <laughs> I was looking to see if Jess was in the room. Yeah. But uh, the, the whole concept of these proanisodidins, the complex carbohydrates that Jess has worked with for yes. years, and it seems like that has come up through a couple of the different uh, projects that you have. But I'd like to know maybe your opinion, are those positive or negative effects on the microbial population are, are they indirect effects by what they might do to change in mucin layers or secretions by the mammalian cells? Do you have any perspective? We on have that? not yet, but we have, I, Jazz and I we discussed a little bit about that. Uh, that's one of the things that we think we could do, also with the proanthocin, not not only like the health side, but also the like how that affect the microbial community, and that could have an impact on the animal as well. That could be something as a follow-up like a study. Um, we are right now focusing on the health aspect, but yeah, any of these molecules could have an uh, impact on modulating probably the, the microbiota, especially the way they act. We don't know like which would be like the concentration that would cause that effect. Um, I think we need... From what I discussed with the, uh, Jazz, no, no. I think, the, I think he actually has an um, ongoing um, project on that. And they, usually they are not used as a substrate. Um, they're not uh, typically metabolized, but they, they can affect, like, they modulate the, the microbiota. Like, you know, and that, that would be something that I'm very interested. Not only that, I mean, with uh, Professor um, 
Then at the Enzyme Institute, he has a, a, diff, a diverse array of uh, oligosaccharides that we also wanted to, to test and evaluate their effects on, on microbial growth. So you look at the alternate sequencing Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also look at the like immune response and all those aspects as well. I think that would be quite interesting in this case. Yeah, thank you. Vanessa. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's something that I'm very interested in, actually. Like, what, um, what factors of the rumen environment modulates, for example, the expression of these uh, molecules? One thing that we learned with the streptococci is that some of them are induced by lactic acid, actually. So that could play a role, for example, in rumen, if you think about rumen acidosis and how, why like, they, they prevail in some... We always assume that, they're, oh, because they metabolize... Um, they starch faster or something like that. Maybe they, they compete better with other microbes also. So that's something that we, we learned with that. It's not, I mean, we test other um, 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 VFAs from, from the rumen ecosystem. It seems to be very selective with the lactic acid. Um, but it, yeah, there are other things about the regulation that's not really well understood that we would love to, to explore more and understand like what really regulate. Are, are there any like plant metabolites that could induce like secondary metabolites or other compounds that will also induce? That would be really interesting to, to evaluate. So yeah, no, that's, that's something that is in, in the radar to, to explore further. Yeah. Yes, go on, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so um, I know you're looking at rumen and fecal, you know, uh, microflora, but so in Wisconsin, we, we pasteurize the vast majority of our milk for, that goes into cheese. But we also say that our most, we're most proud of our cheeses made from raw milk. Yep. <clears throat> I'm curious, what's your opinion? Are, is, is that, are we potentially exposing, you know, consumers to... Um, microflora, native microflora. Granted, I realize you're looking at the intestinal system, but not the milk, but it's not too far away. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Are we potentially exposing, um, you know, consumers to antibiotic-resistant genes and or microflora if they're consuming raw milk cheeses? Um, on the antimicrobial resistance perspective, you, you pretty much will find, like, the antimicrobial resistance gene everywhere. Okay, um, the question of um, raw milk, I mean, we also have the same kind of like in certain regions in Brazil, they're very specific in producing cheese from raw milk. There's also the most famous cheese in certain regions there. They, 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 I came from a state that's called like also the dairy state in Brazil. Um, and one of the most famous cheeses is, is made from raw milk, not pasteurized milk. Um, and yeah, uh, you can have problems that depending how the cheese is preserved and how it's maintained with, especially in the case that we, I saw before with Staphylococcus aureus um, contamination, some of the bacteria that were isolated, um, um, of course, had like uh, genes for um, uh, viral lens genes that uh, could cause problems uh, to humans, but some of them also had uh, antimicrobial resistance genes. So they're there. Um, it depends a little bit of the, how high the population is, because it's just a matter of the population, I think. Um, if you have a very low populations, you usually don't tend to have much effect, although once you ingest that food, I mean, it's going to go through your gastrointestinal tract. They, they could be exposed if you're not degraded. I mean, if the DNA is not degraded, it could be exposed. But if the population is high, that's when you have, like, more problems. And usually, I, I hope, I mean, the quality of the cheese is not... I mean, that bad that will make that a problem. So that's what you usually hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Any final questions?
Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Nivan. A couple of final notes with the Dairy Innovation Hub faculty seminar. We'll always have some treats outside, so before you arrive at the seminar, come a few minutes early and join us for that. You're welcome to have them on your way out. Join us October 19th. Uh, Dr. Joe Stanford from UW Platteville, another Dairy Innovation Hub hire, will be here presenting in his area of um, waste water management. So please join us. So thank you for coming today. Thanks for the content. I know. Oh,